Um, okay, thank you. Uh, morning, everybody. Um, we actually got only 15 minutes, and we're going to cram two speakers into that time, so I will get on really quickly. Uh, what I do is I help uh, executives build models of business challenges, business plans, um, and uh, my friend and colleague here, uh, Rob Brown, is uh, CEO of a business who's actually done this uh, without my help. Uh, just to demonstrate that this is highly uh, doable and practical and uh, useful. So, what is um, a living business model? It's a working quantified simulation that mimics the actual behaviour of all significant, all significant aspects of the enterprise function or issue of concern. So, we're looking at business performance issues, service quality, sales growth, uh, staff turnover, um, fr uh, cash flow, all those kinds of things. Uh, but to do that, you need to capture all the things in the business. You need to capture the, the, the people and the products and the capacity, not just the money. So the, the people I'm mostly talking to tend to think that a business model is just a financial spreadsheet uh, or a sales growth spreadsheet. Well, that's kind of not, not good enough. Um, now, when we do this right, the, the models we, we build actually matches the real world performance that you see. Um, if, if it doesn't, then the model's no good. Uh, we need to be able to replicate what you can see out there in the business. Why do we do this? Uh, well, we've heard this before. It enables you to design the business system before you even uh, start it to see whether it actually will work at all. It allows you to test alternative strategies. It allows you to manage the system so it performs well when it's actually going. Um, there's an awful lot of modeling of, of, of this style done to kind of solve problems. And when you've solved the problem, you throw the model away and that's, that's the end of it. Uh, that's not what we're trying to do here. If this model is useful, it should be continually useful all the time to manage the business and it will help you fix the system if it goes wrong. And we always start with this concern of how the business is performing over time. Here is a startup business that's been going for two years. This is a typical kind of chart that you'd find in a you know, business plan presentation. This is our profits for the year one and two and what we hope for year three and four. That's just not adequate. I mean, the world just changes far too fast for that to be useful. I'm always a bit amused on Dragon's Den when they want to know what the, year, the last year's sales were and what the year three sales are going to be. What about next week? <laughs> what about next month? Um, and we, we can act much faster than that as well. So that, that chart really isn't adequate. This is what we need. We need to see the continuous uh, trajectory of, of change, what's happening week to week, month to month. Um, we do this for business plans for whole uh, enterprises. Um, and uh, Rod will uh, talk about his example shortly. Um, but we can also do it for particular initiatives, for functional plans and issues, what's happening in the HR field, for, at the HR uh, function, for example, over varying timescales. So here's a, um, a, a service quality uh, problem in telecoms that we needed to fix over a matter of weeks. That's how it was getting worse. That's a quality indicator, and we needed to get that uh, um, fixed. Um, this is a staff turnover challenge in an, uh, an aerospace uh, company. The staff turnover in this particular group has been rising, and it was always too high, and we don't like, like that, and we want to figure out how to improve that over a matter of quarters. So the thing these charts have got in common is that they're answering these three generic questions. Why has the business performance got to where it is today? And that's important because answering that question is important because there's lots of information in there about how the system actually works. Uh, where is it likely to go if we don't intervene and change something? And then how can we make it uh, uh, improve and go into the future? So that's our kind of start point for, for all of these kinds of models. So I'll uh, hand over to uh, Rod now, and he can tell you a little bit about his business. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, let me tell you a little bit about, uh, about Open. Uh, it's a home improvement business. Uh, statistically, when, um, if, how many house, homeowners have we got in the room? Yeah, OK. So you're going to know what I'm talking about, right? You're, statistically, you've got a one in five chance. Uh, when you engage somebody to come and improve your home and you loft, uh, kitchen or bathroom, one in five chance of it, of it going wrong. Open is about making that 100% uh, reliable so, so that you, you do not have any, any, uh, any chance of it going wrong. So 20% 20, 20 chance of it going wrong if you, if you don't use open is basically the proposition. Uh, and we do that by very carefully selecting the people that we engage to do, to do the work. 
uh, and we put a bit of technology wrap around it to make the journey a lot smoother and a lot easier. It's always frustrated me in the industry how, how poor it is out there. In fact, uh, it, it, it is so poor, we talked about labour productivity earlier, that there has been negative labour productivity in, uh, dis disimprovement in the home improvement industry, construction industry, since 1945, according to uh, McKinsey Global Index. Uh, uh, and that's just not good enough, that uh, what, what we're facing in the 21st century uh, is a problem that essentially Shakespeare faced when he wanted to improve, improve uh, the, the, uh, the Globe Theatre. So uh, we're going about this in a, in a very different sort of way, using, using, using tech, uh, to try and make sure that the journey for our customers is is better. Uh, but we had a very practical problem, which is how do we go out and how do we raise raise money and so on. Uh, and so we use uh, modeling to help convince investors uh, uh, how how much they should be putting into us to uh, to, to propel us uh, forward. So uh, modeling was a really important part of our of our fundraising fundraising journey. Um, and we had to demonstrate effectively you know, how we were going to build the resources uh, that would make the business in the future. I mean, essentially, uh, there's the classic uh, challenge, which is how do we demonstrate how many uh, customers we're going to acquire over a period of time based on uh, several factors. We've got a very complex supply chain uh, for customers, if you like. Uh, and we have to uh, get them at the beginning where they may be thinking about having a new, a new kitchen, a new bathroom, and then we have to take them all the way through the design process, and then we have to take them, if it's a larger project, through the planning process, uh, party wall negotiations, and so on. A lot of design, uh, a lot of thinking, a lot of um, uh, variations and reversals in, in that thinking, and a lot of people drop out uh, of, uh, if you like, our, our, our potato sorter of customers coming down before they actually get to a point where they sign, and then we've got a long gest gestation period in actually taking it from uh, design to a fully implemented, completed project, and then after that you've got uh, warranties. So we've got a huge pipeline there, which is quite complex and operates over typically over about four, four months between um, first contact and a sale. So that's, that's difficult to explain to uh, to investors uh, uh, and uh, w why we not getting the results immediately in our, in our pipeline. Other business businesses have similar challenges. And we've also got a parallel pipeline uh, underneath that. Um, so uh, I'll come to that soon. We've got, we've got a parallel pipeline underneath that, which is in the supply base, which is in recruiting the contractors uh, to do the work that we're winning from the customers. And we have to tie that all together. So that's quite a complex, dynamical challenge in making sure that we can, with very limited resources in the business, uh, grow the business at the right pace. So we built uh, a, a, a model to, to explain that to investors. And we were very successful in doing that. So uh, this slide is just, it's just me. So I, I, I've um, uh, knocked around the business a little while. Um, and uh, we, we, had, we ended up raising for this business 10 million, 10 million pounds as, as a ca classically venture capital backed uh, business, which was you know, just fabulous. I like to think that some, the, the, the modelers that we were, we were using were instrumental and helpful in getting investors to have the confidence to give, give us money. Uh, very early on, we were backed by Aviva. Uh, which, is, uh, which was a fantastic thing for an early stage business to, to, to have. They have the endorsement of a very large recognized brand to come in and, and do this. And they, they put three million uh, into us. And again, that faith was uh, down to the detailed nature of our, of our planning, which was backed by our ability to, to demonstrate that into the future, if you like, more convincingly perhaps than other people by the use of a model. That model is now, um, uh, and, and since then, of course, we've... Um, uh, as John mentioned, we've we just been acquired by uh, John Lewis, which is you know, a fantastic uh, endorsement. And, and John Lewis are really interested in this space because they want to get into the home. They want to do more for customers in the home. So the, the future vision is that we will build your living room and then, and then fit the blinds and the carpeting and then furnish it for you um, uh, and perhaps do more uh, around you in, in, in your home and in other, other areas. But open as an eye an integral part of that strategy for, for the John Lewis partnership uh, and, uh, and the future of home. So all, all this um, has been helped significantly by, by modeling. Uh, and this, in fact, is the model that we are using now uh, at, if you like, board, board level for, for open. It's a very simple representation of a dynamical uh, model 
but its power is in, in being able to engender the conversation, to, uh, to have people look at the same, if you like, strategic map of the business that is quantitatively based, so it's rational, uh, but also visual, so that we, we can uh, look at it uh, and debate where we should be acting from month to month in terms of making our journey better. Principally, this is the customer pipeline. It's very similar in, in many marketing uh, challenges and so on and so forth. Uh, but there is a corresponding supply uh, pi pipeline uh, that we also have to look at. And the combination of two represent, in fact, the, the, almost the entirety of the business from a high strategic level. And that allows us to, uh, to have the debate. And that's the real power, I think, of, of modeling this. It, had, it enables us to have the debate with investors so that they had the confidence to in invest in us. And it now uh, enables us to have the debate internally and with, with, with my partner, partner colleagues <laughs> in the John Lewis partnership now to explain to them why they should be investing more in one area or, or, or another area. So it enables the debate and it's been an extraordinarily uh, useful tool for, for us to, to, to uh, employ. So, uh, thanks Rod. Um, I'm, if you uh, sign up for the workshop this afternoon, um, you will actually have a chance to uh, run Rod's business, or at least a slightly disguised and simplified version of his business. Rod wouldn't want me to give away all his, uh, all his secrets. Um, so uh, this is a demo model of the uh, open uh, home project business. And uh, there is a simplified uh, project pipeline. We've got inquirers coming in in the large chart on the left, there are projects in the planning stage and there are projects being completed on the right hand side. Uh, you have uh, information on service quality and project quality, you've got the, uh, the, the chart on the left in the green area is telling you about um, the uh, fraction, uh, the conversion rates, so how many inquiries turn into actual uh, projects in planning, how many of those turn into actual uh, sales. Um, and uh, on the right, we've got the financials. So the, the green line is the uh, operating cost. The blue line is the revenue from week to week. And the red line is the operating profit. So you can see we're in the early weeks here. We're losing quite a lot of money um, week in, week out. But by this week 70, <laughs> by, by week 70, we've broken into profit. Um, as I say, you'll have a chance to actually uh, explore and uh, play with this model. And on the left in the, in the red area, the decision to make, how much am I going to spend on marketing and how many staff do I need to take on in order to handle the workload that I will have many weeks out into the future and how many contractors do I need to take on because it's going to take me some weeks to find those contractors and validate them in order to meet the demand that I expect that my pipeline will be giving me two, three, four months out into the future. So it give you a sense of this kind of continual live uh, capturing of how the business is performing. Okay. Now, um, uh, and you can uh, just go and uh, get that model yourself uh, if you go to that link. This'll, I think this is being recorded. So if you, or you could just take a note of it right now, sdl.re slash open demo. That's it. If you go to that, uh, the model will open in your browser. It will work on a phone, but you can't really use it. It's just a, a bit too small uh, real estate on a, on a phone screen. Um, so a, an important message uh, I'd like to get across here is that things have changed in, in, the, in the modeling world. You will see a lot over the rest of the day about big, complicated, sophisticated, very powerful models that do amazingly awesome things. Right? I have two unfortunate characteristics. One is I have a very low boredom threshold, and the other is that I'm very lazy. So I basically need to be able to, to, uh, to address problems very fast and get to an answer very quickly. Uh, I haven't got time to hang around. Uh, and fortunately, things have changed so that I can actually do that. I can continue to be lazy and have a low boredom threshold and actually solve problems. And the things that have changed are that the method of building these models has been substantially improved. Uh, we now have an agile process that you can take people through, which is very rigorous, but very practical. It's now possible for people to build these, uh, these models and better tools that allow them to do it really quickly. 
Now, the result of this, and my target here is every analyst, every consultant, every management accountant out there. That's who I'm after, right? They should all be doing this, right? They should all be building these models. They should not be sitting there on, the, on those stupid spreadsheets. Um, and why should they be doing it? Because it's easier to do this, it's faster to do this, and it's more reliable. For example, these models will not let you make cell reference errors. It's just impossible. Right? And items in these models are not a dollar thirty-two; they are sales and costs and profit and people. Right? So this is much much easier uh, than it's been in the past. Um, why do these models work? There are some things about the real world that are just a bit complicated for the human brain to get their head around. Um, there are th things that accumulate over long periods of time, those things in Rod's uh, customer pipeline, for example. There are interdependencies between the staffing and the contractors um, and the financials and the projects in, in Rod's case. And that gives rise to feedback. So things start rolling and then they kind of run away from you, uh, sometimes in a good way, sometimes in a bad way. Um, Something that many spreadsheet models simply don't even consider is that there are quite serious threshold effects all over uh, business uh, issues. Things are going fine and fine and fine and fine until all of a sudden they're not. They just fall off a cliff uh, because you've crossed some threshold where, where things that were okay aren't okay anymore. Uh, and, uh, and we deal with intangible factors as well. So we've actually got the quality of the projects that these contractors do uh, in the model. Uh, and just a note, I know there are some people here who are not from a business uh, environment. These issues are exactly the same in the public sector and in nonprofit cases, uh, and the solution is exactly the same as well. So this is just as relevant for you. Uh, if you want to learn more, come to the workshop this afternoon. Um, and if you have people who you think should be doing this, go and check out our online courses. There are free resources there. Um, go and look at that, that first link up there, sdl.re slash courses, and then you'll find a link to that uh, free course to, to get you started. There's tons more free material on our website, and there's lots of uh, videos on, on our uh, YouTube channel as well. So there we are. Done.